Because we can fake those things. We can fake a dance. We can fake a shout. We can fake the run. But when you lay hands on the blind, when you lay hands on the lame, when you see a soul wrapped up in addiction and bondage, and they come to an altar and they stand up and in the name of Jesus they are free. You can't fake that stuff. Addition and subtraction. I'm preaching tonight on death, but mathematics. And you know where I'm going if you got a brain at all, and maybe not. Maybe you have a brain, you just haven't been programmed for it. I'm just going to help you out here. Let's talk about holiness. Come on. That's why most of you here anyway. Come on, Come see what our pulpit looks like. <laughs> I know it's always an astounding thing. How can we preach against sin? How can we promote a holy life and have a thriving church? My question is. How can you have a church filled with the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Preach the Word of God, live a holy life, overflow with the love of God, <coughs> and not love the city slap up. Amen. How? How can you have a house filled with Holy Ghost filled believers and not see the Right. Cause and effect. I, I believe in absolutes. If I read 2 Chronicles 7.14, which gives us absolutes. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, no more. We have to admit we got a problem. I pray that you admit that you have a problem. I woke up this morning and said, Lane, we got problems. We have to admit we got a problem. And you have a problem as long as there's no revival, as long as there's no victory, no, no zeal, no awe, no power. You've got a problem because God wants to pour His Spirit out upon us more than we want Him to pour it out upon us. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, there's an absolute, then I will. If you will do those four things, I will do these three things. Yeah. I will hear from heaven, I will forgive your sins, and I will heal your land. And so if our land is not healed, if the, if the ground is parched, and the, if the rivers are drying up, the creeks are driving, drying up, the brooks are drying up, if there's no conversions, there's no miracles, there's no power, there's no seal, stop looking at people saying, worldly, 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 and look in the mirror and say, what is wrong with you? And then I didn't pray. I didn't see his face. I didn't turn from my wicked ways. If I do these four things, God will do his things. I love absolutes. It takes away all the questions. So now when I wake up, if there's no victory in me, I don't blame you. I don't blame the church. I don't blame the church down the road. I don't blame a movement. I don't blame my mama. I don't blame my grandpa. I look in the mirror and say, Lamb, if you'll do these four things, God will do these three things. And until you do those four things, these three things,
if I love God, I'll keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous, they're glorious. When you have a holiness that confines you and puts you in bondage and you're suffocating and you've got no victory, no joy, no peace, it's not holiness. It's legalism. But real holiness, real love, real joy will set you free and let you skip and whistle and sing amazing grace. He'll let you cry. He'll let you fall and get back up. He'll let you make mistakes and the people around you will pick you up and love you. That is your Bible and essence of holiness. I believe it more than I've ever believed it. There's a hunger inside of me to guard myself like never before. I see the, the vision unfolding in Revival Tabernacle and I realize that I'm just a man, but I also realize that the unction and anointing that comes upon this house will flow through me as the pastor, as a conduit. And anything that I put in my mind or in my heart that will hinder that flow, it doesn't only affect me, it affects the people. So I find myself not making, uh, not looking or not thinking or not watching or not listening more than I've ever done in my life because I want my hands to be clean and I want my heart to be not so you can say he's holy but so the power of the Holy Ghost can speak through me and heal the people and teach them the everlasting truths of the Bible I find myself becoming jealous of the anointing I have sinned I have grieved God and I've tried to make it right I, was, I knew I'd sin I asked God to forgive me and try to go to the pulpit and it was so dry And I wasn't focused. People ask me, I said, what is the anointing? Well, obviously the anointing is the Holy Ghost manifesting Himself. But in, uh, in here, in this more practical element, the anointing is focus. It is, it is a spiritual mind elevated in both sides. Did you ever notice how you can preach one sermon to one congregation and it blows up? And you go to another church, preach the exact same sermon, and they look at you like you're stupid. You were just as known at both times, but there was a breakdown in focus. There has to be a focus in the house. And the only way that we can all get to that place is that we're all walking in the Spirit. We're all walking in the Spirit. And when we all come in with an elevated state of mind, a spiritual state of mind, then I can preach focused like I am now. And you can listen focused like you are now. And God can move in a house and do great things. Yes. Yes. Holiness is a love language of God. I was taught that. But invariably, just like we do with every awesome and beautiful truth, there was a corruption of addition and subtraction. I suffered a slow death by the hands of supposed spiritual mathematicians. You see, what they did, they taught me that holiness was God's love language. But then they did the exact same thing the Pharisees did. They told me that holiness was an external code of ethics. Do's and don'ts. What's the big deal? Every one of us believe that if you're a drunkard and you get saved, you've been drinking. There are some thou shalt not. There are some don't do that. What's the big deal, Pastor? Let me testify. Can I do that for a moment? What's the big deal? If I, if I can do this, if I can, if I can say it. Wait, I, mean, I was madly in love with God. And I wanted to express to Him how much I loved Him. They told me holiness was the love language of God. I believe that I still do. And then they told me that holiness was this. This rigorous set of do's and don'ts. And I loved God with all of my heart and I wanted to speak His love language. So I quit eating chocolate. I quit drinking pop. I quit drinking coffee. I quit drinking tea. I wouldn't wear a necktie anymore. All I would wear is white shirts. I wouldn't wear a suit coat because they were all worldly. If I wore a pair of suspenders with gold, I took sandpaper and sanded it off. Some of y'all don't know who I am. If I had a belt on and it had gold paint, even though it wasn't gold, you know the scripture re references wearing gold. So if I had a gold, gold paint on my gold buckle, I'd sand it off because I wanted to love God. And somebody says to me, well, what's the big deal about that? Because the more you lay down, the more sacrifices, etc., etc. I'm going to tell you why. Because it pushed me into the snake handling movement. Because I was too holy for the people that I was surrounded by. And I was pushed into a movement of people that in my spirit and my heart I knew were wrong. But they didn't eat chocolate a lot of them. They didn't drink coffee. And they did all these things. And then I decided that I was holier than them. 
and it created a cultic mentality. I had a deep, mad love for God and I had a deep, mad love for the people, but I was so cultic in my mind, I, would, I couldn't reach anybody because nobody could be saved. And it put me in a group of people that when I came to realize that they could be saved, they were allowed to be saved. And then I was forced to make a decision. I was forced to stay inside of them. I didn't want to leave. Nobody wants to leave their family. Nobody wants to leave all they've ever known, the comfort zone. I, I remember one clear and distinct conversation I had with God. It was two in the morning. And I was walking the floors. And the devil said to me, if you preach the blood of Jesus, you want to lose your church? You're going to lose your family, you're going to lose your friends, you're going to lose your fiance. And the Spirit of the Lord thundered in my ear and He said, but if you don't, you're going to lose your soul. I preached it. I lost the church. I lost every family member I had at that time. Now God has restored. My mother's a member of our church. She's working tonight. We have the best relationship we've ever had. I lost every friend I had except Joe Salem. Her mom would no longer let me see her. I lost it all. And I wept and I cried, but I knew. I knew. And I was preaching this. And I knew that if I was preaching this with the right motives and the right heart, God was going to fix it all. Stand-up sister man. Seventeen year stand-up area. Where's my baby girl Eden? Stand up, man. Judah, stand up. Where's Josiah? He's in the restroom. I got her. I got the chick. I got the chick. A pastor in the most powerful churches on the planet. People getting saved is a reality here. I'll tell you something about it's been going the last couple of weeks will blow your mind. What if I had decided? What if I had chosen people? What if I chose a family? So I wanted to show them I love them. So I them all these things. And at the end of the day, I had this long list of do's and don'ts to check them all off. And I was the most miserable person that I know. Because an external code of conduct is not holiness. Holiness is God manifested through us. And there is life in God. There is love in Him. And when I come to this pulpit as a father, a spiritual father, I want them to have God. Yeah. And if it takes a week, a month, a year, if it takes 10 years, I'm going to keep preaching God. I'm going to keep preaching Jesus, 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 Jesus. I'm going to go to this pulpit, take this mic and say, the blood, 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 the blood. I'm going to keep saying, read the Bible, read the Word, read the Bible, pray, 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 pray. Because I know that I can, I can convince them to live a certain way. I can convince them to check off my list of do's and don'ts and they'll still go to hell. But if I can convince them that if they get filled with God, if I can convince them to have Jesus Christ living in them, everything else is going to come naturally out of a love for God. My daughters are so programmed now they don't hesitate. They say, Dad, why do we do this? Why do we do that? I never say because you're going to go to hell. I say because I want you to love Jesus. And it may not be a sin, but I believe it glorifies God more. And I want you to love God so much that it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever glorifies God more, that's what I want you to do. And then we're free. Then we have liberty. Can I go a little bit further and get this a little bit more personal? Yes. 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 Yes.
When someone asks us what denomination we are, Re Re Revival Tabernacle, and I don't mean to be offensive to anybody, we're at a point now we just say we're Christians. Because I don't know where you're from, but here, if you say you're Pentecost, if you say you're holiness, you could be a snake hammer, you could be Jesus only, you could be a linguist, you could be a thousand different things. That's the reason our church, is, there's no description out there, it's just Revival Tabernacle. I love the word revival. I love the word tabernacle. I always liked Rich Lane's tabernacle and one of the tabernacles. I thought it was cool. And I want revival, so I just call it revival tabernacle. I don't know if it was God or not, but it's worth it. I'd like to think it was God. It's been good. I got folks all over the place who want to call the churches revival tabernacle. I say, call it whatever you want to call it. Ain't none of my business. It can mean anything. And I don't want a sign to define it. I don't want a sign to define our church. And I'm not saying if it's, that's what you got. I, I'm not saying any. I'm talking about me. I want them to park in the back park where I come into church. And say, boom, oh, these people got the power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. There's something different about them too. Yeah. I want their testimonies to be the sign. So we ask them, what are you? I've been across the wholeness. Now tell me. Tell me, tell me, tell me. When you are in your community at Walmart... And you tell somebody that you're Pentecostal holiness. What picture does that evoke in their mind? Now, if you said Jesus, that evokes a picture. You said the book of Acts, it evokes a picture. But if you said I'm a Pentecostal holiness man, it evokes a picture. Not all, but by and large. Do they envision a church filled with love? Do they envision a church that's filled with mercy? And long suffering. When you say that I'm a holiness man, do they think the first thing think these guys are evangelistic? When you say I'm a holiness man, I'm Pentecostal. How you excuse that? Do they? Is the first thing that they envision is broken people, the lost, being on your altars, being saved, and food banks, and drug awareness programs, and homes for battered women? Is that the first thing they think about? And you don't have to answer it because I know the answer. I know the answer here. I know the answer in my context. When you say you're Pentecostal, when you say you're holiness, they say you're a bunch of judgmental, hypocritical devils. And you want to know why? Because they came to their churches and they chewed them up and spit them out and said, we don't care if you ever come back or not because you're not like us. You don't talk like us. You don't think like us. You don't look like us. You don't act like us. Therefore, we don't want you. All we want is a cookie cutter model of what we think Christianity is. And you know what? You didn't look like that when you came to God either. He didn't say he can flip flop. He saved you when you was on the bar stool, getting high, running around, acting like a, 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 a insane fool. But Jesus was merciful and gracious. And if you've got a bit of humility, you'll say God is still working on me. So why don't we let God work on everybody else too? Right. It wasn't the case in the book of Acts. It wasn't the case in the New Testament. When the Christians descended on a city, they didn't say a bunch of hypocrites. They said, these that have turned the world upside down have come among us. The people that didn't like them said it. The people that loved them said it. They had a lot of opinions about them. But at the end of the day, they were the ones that flipped the world upside down and then preached the gospel and flipped it right side up. Somebody shout amen. Yeah. I honestly goodness, had no intention on raising my voice tonight. And I can do it. I can go hours and just teach. I feel this. I feel it in my bones tonight. I want them to say these that have turned the world upside down are down there on 129 feet kill that. We've isolated ourselves from the world as opposed to insulating ourselves and going into it preaching the gospel. We can't go into it because of our cultic leanings. The corrupt us. I can't leave you to let her. You're, you're just gonna, everybody's just going to backslide. That's the kind of church. That's, that's how strong your church is. That a person can come in that doesn't think like you. It's going to screw up the whole church. That's not the church's fault. That's your fault, preacher. You're not equipping the people with the proper. Is it possible for someone to be led astray? Of course. But if reaching the lost and having people from Baptist churches and Methodist churches and Pentecostal churches all convening in the same house scares you because you're afraid that all the new people are going to affect the three members that you got and so you run them all off? What's wrong with us? Where did 
God's perfect. Preach it. Watch and see what happens. Y'all get quiet. That means you're either sleepy or it's working. Or you're mad. Either one. I'm okay with that too. As long as I get something out of it. 31,103 verses in the Bible. 31,103 verses in the Bible. And when you say you're holiness, that only means one thing. That's six verses. Two hundredth of a percent of the Bible is what defines you. Because you men, we don't do certain things, we don't go certain places, and we don't say certain things. And we have mastered the art of telling people what we don't do. These that have turned the world upside down, they weren't known for what they tore down and what they didn't do. They were known for what they did do. Right. I'm having so much fun. I can't really handle myself. Four Gospels chock full of Jesus' teachings. And not once did he place an emphasis on externals. Not one time. The master preacher. Not once. And I, brothers, out of sincerity, Brother Smith, you know me well. If you brothers can come to me with the Gospels and show me where Jesus put an emphasis on externals, I promise you I'll come to school and repair. I will ask you for mercy and I'll preach it properly. You see, I've read the Gospels maybe a couple hundred times. I've read the Gospel a dozen times looking for this. He never emphasized externals. Not one time, not a single, not a single record. But he did emphasize the heart. Over and over and over. Why? Because he was preaching a deeper holiness. He said, You said, but I say. You say if you take your, your you take another man. I say if you look at it and lust after it in your heart, you've already. It was a deeper hope. It was deeper. It was more profound. It was more powerful. He didn't have to preach on externals, on, on adultery, because he knew that if he eradicated that and filled their heart with love, that they wouldn't want to dress provocatively and allure their brother or sister into an adulterous relationship. He produced a deeper holiness that kept them in the midnight hours when they were on the computer and nobody was watching. They said, I cannot violate my wife because there was holiness on the inside. Somebody shout amen. Because they fear sin, not hate sin, and they know they can't handle it. Saints of God, just because you can't handle it doesn't mean I can't handle it. In the name of Jesus, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And if we get an internal holiness, we'll find that not only can we live right, we'll want to live right. What was Jesus doing? He was looking at men that were always knocking down spider webs. And Jesus said, You're wasting your time. You've got to search and track down the spider and kill the soul. He got tired of dealing with the symptoms of things and they had all the externals right. And over and over again, he said, you're hypocrites, you're murderers, you're devils, you're foxes. But oh, he said, if you'll get the inside of the coming platter right, the outside of me right also. It's organic. So Pastor Fred, I told you a story. You just brace yourself, please. Snap your seatbelt in because I'm just going to make you up. It's going to be bad. Just for a second. So she's committing adultery while her husband is gone with a drummer. They're committing adultery before church. He's drumming and she's dancing and hallelujah. I mean, they're committing adultery before service at the Holy Church. And coming to playing drums and dancing and shouting and hallelujah, and they got caught. They always get caught. <laughs> Pastor's trying, trying to restore her, and he's counseling her, and she says these unbelievable words. I don't know what the big deal is. It's not like I was wearing pants. <laughs> True story. He said, Brother, she's, she's a burger and 
a whole order of fries short of the half a You see, that's not the problem. The problem is she caught that somewhere. You see, she's been in around the church for decades. You see, she wasn't really saying she had a wife and a husband and several kids. She functioned just like you. But that is what she caught by listening to us preach and talk in the way we act and the way we conduct ourselves. Jesus preached exclusively on the heart and the result was pure, pure hearts and clean hands. Holy Ghost filled saints living holy lives, changing the world. Men and women ceasing from adultery because there was no adultery in their hearts. I had a, past, a, a pastor cancel me. I'm almost done, guys. I had a pastor cancel me from preaching his youth camp a couple years ago. He'd asked, he wanted me to preach it, and then he never contacted me. And I was so busy here, I just forgot. And I, I'd heard that somebody else had preached it. He never even called me to tell me anything. I, I, I didn't really care. It's one of those deals. I've been, I've been cut down, cut off so many times. If it doesn't happen, at least once or twice a month, I start feeling like something's wrong. But a friend of mine went to that church. And the guy said, man, I've heard some bad stuff about Brother Lamb. So we canceled him on that youth camp. And my brother said, well, what did you hear? He said, I heard that Brother Lamb had vowed to preach nothing but the Bible the rest of his life. End of story, period. Close the book. That was it. And I thought, hmm. Man, I've been cut off with a lot of stuff. Three weeks ago, somebody said, why do folks call you up and tell you all the bad stuff? You like, I want to know that. Today, Pastor, they called you out from the big camp meeting about a month ago now. Said you was a charlatan because you had vowed to preach nothing but Jesus. How do you mean that? It's true. I'm guilty of that one. I don't have anything to explain. I'm sorry, but I believe it's perfect, just like it's written. To be honest, I'm following the footsteps of some pretty prestigious ministers in that too. Take for instance the Holy Ghost. John 15, 26, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, who proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify to me. What about Paul? 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. For I am determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The word is powerful all by itself. Can I land this thing? Are y'all ready for me to quit? I know y'all are. So he takes this, he goes to the publisher and he says, I want you to make me some New Testaments. And he said, I want you to write on the cover of it, the New Testament. He said, all right. A couple months went by. He gets a, a letter in the mail, says, we got your Bibles. He goes down to the printing house and he picks up the Bible. And the guy says, oh, I needed to tell you. I didn't have enough room to put the New Testament on there. So we just put TNT on it. How many knows the word of God has got the power to blast tonight? How many knows it's going to blast your blues away? It'll blast sin out of the house. But you just got to preach the Bible just like it says. I remember sitting across the table from a precious sister and she said to me, I wish the Bible was clearer on what we believe. She's in her 70s, so I didn't say anything. I wanted to say a lot. She didn't even understand what she said, but she said two major things. A lot of things she said, two major things. The first thing that she said was, there's things that I believe that are not in the Bible. Because if it's not in the Bible, who cares? You're not going to make me do it. You're not even going to make me feel bad anymore. I'm going to love you. I'm going to hate it for you because you're missing out on a wonderful friend. Hey, I've got a lot of flaws, but I'm a pretty good guy. And loyalty is extremely important to me. If you and me are friends, we're friends. I don't care what you do, we're friends. And if you don't, you believe stuff the Bible doesn't say, that's your business. Pour it on it. Leave me, my wife, my kids, and my church alone. The 
second thing you know what she said? It's a shock. She was saying that my understanding of the Bible is clearer than the Bible. Right. You see it? You see it? That's the way my mind thinks. Bang, 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 bang. And I just shut my mouth because I knew I couldn't help her. She said, I believe things that are not in the Bible. And she said, I believe the Bible clearer than the Bible says it. And I was, I was speechless. I was not, not, not really, but I, I didn't want, she was an older woman, and so I didn't want to rebuke her or try to hurt her. As we close, the Word of God is perfect. It's crystal clear. If the Bible says something is a sin, preach it until hell trembles. I mean, just like it says it. Just like it says it. Don't add, a, don't add a single thing to it. But Pastor, what about, that's my point. Shh. And I'm going to tell you what our problem is. I'm going to sum it all up here. I'm going to... If the Bible says it's a sin, preach it till hell screams. But if the Bible is silent on it, be silent. There's no need to add to it. There's no need to take away from it. Are we so pompous? Are we so arrogant that we actually think we can improve on what God's Word says? Listen, I'm a preacher. I am exegeting the Scripture tonight. There is a certain element in which we interpret, we, we explain. We've got to be careful. This is what I'm going to say to you, and I want you to think about this through the night. We don't have faith in the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Bible. Some faith, but we don't have absolute faith. We don't really believe that we can just open that book up and preach it just like it says it and take our hands off of it. And God will walk up and down the aisles and probe and deal and go home with them. And in the middle of the night, they'll wake up and remember that verse. We don't really believe it. Have faith in the Spirit's dealings. Have faith in His working with individuals. Preach Jesus. Preach His life. Preach His parables. Preach His proverbs. Teach the Pauline epistles. Teach them exactly as they are written. Preach them in context. Let us cease regurgitating our preferences and personal convictions out of the people. Preach nothing but the Bible. The book of Corinthians was just a letter. There were no chapters, no verses. Just a letter. Paul sat down and he probably didn't describe and he wrote. He said, I want you to take this down to the church of Corinth. And they took that letter into the church and they all sat down and the pastor stood up and he read 16 chapters of what we call He read that whole book and they wept and they cried. And there was nothing else that needed to be said because Paul already said it. How do you how do you how do you fix that? It is so clear. And you heard last year, it's an eternal gospel, which means it's as relevant right now as it was when it came out of his mouth. After you can rewind just a couple thousand years earlier, and you can watch as the Hebrew people gathered in thrones and the priests would take the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus. I love it. It harnesses so many incredible truths, but most people can't hardly stomach it because of so many laws and, and, the, and all these different you know, aspects of the lepers and all of these things. They read that and the people stood for hours and wept like babies. And they said, Amen. Amen. No microphone, no shouting, no Pentecostalism, no music, no pianos, no guitars, none of this. Just people that were so amazed that God spoke and men wrote it down and they were able to hear the words of God and it changed them forever because the Word of God is powerful. It will change you. You see, for a lot of people, the Word of God is nothing but letters and some numbers dictating chapters and verses. But the, the, the power of the Word of God is not necessarily in the lettering and the words. It's what it does when it gets on the inside of you. It's bringing life inside of you. When you can't quote a verse because the Word is in your heart. David said, Thy Word, if I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. 
If we spent more time teaching the people and cultivating a love for God's word in the people, that when they went home, they weren't just having church here and never think about it, but they went home and they were wearing their Bibles out, our preaching would be so simple. We could just come in and shout, Jesus, 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 half the time. It wouldn't matter what you preached. When you started to quote a verse, the people started popping it off after you. You got a people so powerful, so anointed, so steady, so real, so anointed that you could just come in and see the sick healed instead of us coming in and have an altar call after altar call and trying to get the saints saved over and over and over again. If we could cultivate a love for God's word, the people would grow and the people would be strengthened and the people would be anointed. And when the enemy came in like a flood, it was in their wilderness experience, they would be able to say, it is written. Thou shalt not live uh, by every red alone, by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If we can teach the people that the word of God is more than just a book of religious sayings, but it is the very inspired breath of God that while I'm walking around fighting hell all day long, the word of God is inside of me, strengthening me, lifting me, empowering me, and I'm going to make it through. And if I can do that, so can you. And if I can get the people not God's word, you've got to If you have to add, if you can't stop yourself from adding, let's at least do a bit more. Let's do it right. Let's teach people some addition that will save their life. What do you say? Second Peter 1 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. You want to learn how to add? Let's add. Add to your faith virtue. And virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Never fall. You'll never be unfruitful. You'll never be barren. You'll never fall. And if I'm a pastor, I want to teach the people how to add in a way that they'll never be unfruitful. They'll never fall. They'll never fail. And it's right here in the Bible. Amen. If you're teaching people how to act properly, virtue to faith, knowledge to virtue, temperance to knowledge, patience to temperance, godliness to patience, kindness to godliness, to charity to kindness, if you do that and they apply, and you produce a church that will never be barren, unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus, when you do that, you produce the people that never fall. And when you have a people like that, God's going to take the mathematics just a little further. Yes. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. They have Pentecost, they're now in the streets of Jerusalem preaching, men and women, exhorting and exalting the name of Jesus everywhere they go. 241, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts 247, praising God and having favor with all the people of the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 4 and 4, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Last page. 514, And believers were more than added to the Lord and multiple, multitudes both of men and women. Adding, adding, adding. When you've got people that are strengthened by proper addition, they will multiply. Around the year 518. Historians will call it the Middle Ages. Those more inclined to look to the spiritual call it the Dark Ages. A thousand years, 1500, back to 500. The reason they call it the Dark Ages is because the cat. I'm done, guys. Don't quit me yet. The Catholic Church has put a stranglehold on the body. They removed every Bible in their language. And the only manuscripts available were in Latin. The priests did their mass in Latin. The word was in Latin. I'm not telling you that there weren't smuggled editions here or there, but by and large, 50 generations of people had no word. 
Around 15, 16, a man by the name of Martin Luther he began to watch how the Catholic Church was just sucking the life, the money, and the resources out of the people. And they said, and I had that saying go in the, the coffers, the cool cleats, and had a purgatory or something to spring or something along those lines. And basically, you could not get closer to God unless you bought something, a relic, or some sort of a tangible thing that you could worship and serve or pray to or buy or purchase in order to get yourself closer to God. And Martin Luther says, the just shall live by faith. He's quoting the Word of God. And thousand years darkness. And I had a good, I had a man tell me one time, he said, I don't know what the big deal about Martin Luther is. He said, all they did was nail the 95 thesis on the Wittenberg University door. Again, he was an older man, so I just kept my mouth shut. I do that. Unless they're really, unless I have to. And I stood there and I said, brother, you couldn't have read anything about Martin Luther. The 95 thesis was 95 points refuting the bishops and the, the, the priests and the church as a whole. And it was powerful. And they said that when Martin Luther's dad read that, he trembled because Luther had basically shook his fist at the most powerful entity on the planet, but that's not what broke the Dark Ages. Martin Luther looked at the priests because they were pushing him out, and he said, listen to me and listen to me carefully. When I'm done, the plowman will know more Scripture than you. He began to grab all the texts from Erasmus and the text is receptive as much as uh, that was available to him, all of those, as much as he could. Different historians will give different accounts of dates. Some say a little over 30 days. Some say from about November of 1516 to March or December of 1516 to March of 1517. He translated the Bible from Latin to German. Brothers and sisters, what happens when the Word of God enters into a dark place? The Reformation. Stand across the house.